Glory to God. Welcome to our Righteousness 101 course for our Bachelors of Theology and Religious Studies. Today we're going to start off on lesson number two, the restoring work of righteousness. Righteousness and the restoring work of it. I want to point out something to you. What is righteousness? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, that's going to be the first scripture that we go to. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Now and then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. What is righteousness? We define righteousness as the first definition, the perfect nature of the Father in you as your very own nature. The perfect nature of the Father in you as your very own nature. Number two, righteousness is the ability to stand in the presence of God with no sense of sin, inferiority, guilt, weakness, or shame of any kind. The ability to stand in the presence of God with no sense of sin, inferiority, guilt, weakness, or shame of any kind. That's what righteousness is. Now, both the fall and the resurrection are realities in life. Go ahead and write that down. Both the fall and the resurrection are realities in life. This is what I mean by that statement. The fall of Adam is self and the effects of that fall are real. Adam fell, sin came in, Adam fell, death came in, Adam fell, sickness came in, Adam fell, Satan began to reign in the earth, Adam fell, we became servants. All of these things, the fall and the effects of that fall are real. But the resurrection of Christ itself and the effects of that resurrection are real as well. So we, if, if Adam's fall was real and the effects of that fall is real, then the resurrection of Christ is real and the effects of that resurrection is real. The immediate result of the fall of Adam was sin, death, and the curse. Go ahead and write it down. Sin, death, and the curse. That was the immediate effects of Adam's fall. But the immediate result of the resurrection of Christ was righteousness, life, and the blessing. You got that? So when Adam fell, this is what happened immediately. Sin came in, death came in, the curse came in. Now, with the resurrection, this is what happened immediately when Christ rose from the dead. Righteousness came in, life came in, blessing came in. So now we're going to talk about sin versus righteousness. Both sin and righteousness are threefold, and I want you to write down these three different things. Point A, sin and righteousness are threefold. Nature, stance, acts. That's A, B, and C. Nature, stance, S-T-A-N-C-E, stance, and acts. Nature, stance, and acts. In other words, when, man, when sin came in, it was in nature. In his nature, he became sinful. It wasn't just what he did. It was who he was. He became sin. His stance changed. In the earth, his stance changed. In heaven, he was separated from God. He was no longer a son. In the earth, he was no longer in dominion. He became a servant. In hell, he became a citizen there. That's his stance. And the acts of sin showed up. Now, just like there was nature stance and acts in sin, there's also the nature stance and acts in righteousness. In righteousness, our stance our nature is now righteous. Our stance in heaven, earth, and hell change. Our stance with God was restored, with sons of God. Our stance in the earth is restored. We have dominion over all the earth. Our stance in hell change. We, we are the victors over, over Satan. Not the victims, but the victors. And our acts are of righteousness. So here's the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was to point out the fact that we had a problem and to point our inability to solve it. That's all the law was designed to do. To point that we needed, a, it was our schoolmaster to show that we needed Christ. It was to point out that I had an internal problem that I could not stop. I couldn't solve it. I was weak. I was helpless. I was unable, have lacking ability to stop the problem. 
It was designed by God to use the nature of the father as our standard for living and to contrast his nature with our nature, pointing out that we needed help, thus leading us to the place of dependency. That was the purpose of the law, to bring us to a place of dependency, of depending on Christ. Limited righteousness. This is the Old Testament, the old order of addressing the sin issue. The Old Testament worked like this. The blood of animals were offered continually to cover the problem, to cover sin. Now, if the blood of animals was there to cover it, we had to point out that the problem was still there. The problem was still there. The problem didn't go anywhere. It's just covered. Number two, God was allowed to come on man. This is the old way of dealing with uh, sin. This is limited righteousness. The blood of animals covered the sin. God was allowed to come on man. Number three, the sacrifice could not make man right in any way. In nature, stance, or acts. It couldn't make him right in any way. God was able to the sin was covered. God was able to come on man, but it couldn't make man right in any way. Number three, it could not remove the consciousness of sin. In other words, there was a mental damage that came with the fall. And sin caused this damage, but the blood of animals, the old art of addressing this sin issue, it couldn't remove the mental damage consciousness of sin it couldn't it couldn't fix the mental damage of it this sin consciousness caused many to cause 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 men to see himself as weak unworthy no good sinners servants and this was true before christ came now after jesus came we went from limited righteousness to unlimited righteousness what is unlimited righteousness the new order of addressing sin number one the blood of jesus was offered once to cover, to forever cleanse sin, excuse me. The blood of Jesus was offered once to forever cleanse sin. That's, limit, that's unlimited righteousness. Number two, God was allowed to come into man. God was allowed to come into man, not just on him. He was now able to live in him. Number three, this sacrifice would make man right in every way, in nature, stance, in acts. It would make him right in every way. Number four, it removes the consciousness of sin. It removes the consciousness of sin. Hebrews chapter nine points out that the sacrifice of Jesus was to remove the consciousness of sin. And Hebrews chapter 10 points out that it only had to happen once. Jesus doesn't have to keep dying, keep shedding his blood. That one time, one sacrifice, one blood did more than enough. So now we're going to talk about total restoration, total restoration. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 through 10, we're going to read it out to amplify it. It's on your sheet. Watch what it says. For in him, the whole fullness of deity, the Godhead, continues to dwell in bodily form, giving complete expression of the divine nature. And you are in him, made full, and having come to the fullness of life. In Christ, you too are filled with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and reach full spiritual stature. You reach full spiritual stature, and he is the head of all rule and authority of every angelic principality and power. He is the head of all rule and authority of every angelic principality and power. Sin consciousness. Now let's take a look. What does it mean to be sin conscious? This is what it means. Sin consciousness produces doubt. It strengthens fears. It develops insecurities. It produces unholy behavior. It is the cause of sensual living. Sensual. S-E-N-S-U-A-L. Sensual living. It is the cause of failure. It leads to despair and depression. It is the manifestation of weakness. That's sin consciousness. Now we're going to talk about righteousness consciousness. Righteousness consciousness produces faith. It brings forth boldness. It develops confidence. 
It produced holy behavior. It is the cause of spirit-led living. It is the cause of victory. It leads to a resurrection of hope and expectation. It is the manifestation of strength. The notes on righteousness points out this. It is received by faith. The way that I receive righteousness, according to Romans chapter 3, verse 26, I receive it by faith. I don't do anything to do it. I just believe that I receive it through Christ Jesus and I and I receive it. We receive righteousness by faith in what Christ has done. His sacrifice, his resurrection, his works makes us into what we are. To deny this righteousness is to deny the potency of his work. It is to say that his work wasn't strong enough. So no, I received this righteousness not based on my doing, but based on what he did. Number two, this righteousness is revealed by faith. Romans chapter 1 verse 17 says, and the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The more truth we believe and we have faith in, the more righteousness can be revealed and manifest manifested. So once we begin to gain truth, we begin to live at that stage of truth and manifest righteousness. And we gain more truth than we believe it and we manifest more righteousness. We gain more truth and we manifest more righteousness. There are only two reasons for possessing a sin conscious mindset. Two reasons. Number one, the person has never crowned Jesus as Lord and are not born again. That's the first reason. The person has never crowned Jesus as Lord and they're not born again. Number two, the person is ignorant of their rights, their stance, and their privileges in Christ. The person is ignorant of their rights, their stance, and their privileges in Christ. The person has never crowned Jesus as Lord and are not born again. The person is ignorant of their right stance and privileges in Christ. Glory to God. These are your restoring work of righteousness. Everything that sin did, righteousness undid through Christ Jesus. Glory to God. I thank God that you are restored. Now I want to pray with you. I want you to look up those scriptures. I want you to study those points. I want you to get them in your spirit. And I'm going to pray with you. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you begin to lead the leaders, Lord God, that are listening to this broadcast, that are tuning in, the students that are a part of it. I pray that you build them, that you strengthen them, that you bless them, that they will go forward in faith, that they will continue on in your word and nothing by no means shall distract them. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.